السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته كيف حالكم جميعا يا أيها الأخوة والأخوات الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا وعلى سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم I'm about this is the third installment to the Ignite your, Par Par um, your Passion series. And this series, we started by the permission of Allah Jalla wa Ala as a way of encouragement others by the permission of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to be able to chase their dreams or to do whatever they set out to put forth with the permission of Allah Jalla wa Ala especially when it comes to learning this beautiful deen. So this particular installment will talk about my journey as a translator. But before beginning into the talk, inshallah, we would like to bring some statements from Sheikh Saleh Fouzan, Hafidhullah, um, that is tremendous, and hopefully we all can benefit from it. Bi'ithnillah. Man kana muhsinan bi'ilmi wa al-khitam. So the Sheikh he says and he begins, this is a small clip that he gave that was very emotional. The Sheikh he says, whether a person is a muhsin, someone who reached the high level of ihsan, and someone who does good in their deen, they first and foremost in their deeds, or if a person is someone who is muqassir, someone who falls short, someone who have deficiencies, someone who always doesn't hit the mark. He says the intended purpose is that we worry about having a good ending for actions are judged in concluding by the way that they are ended meaning in the conclusion of an action it's not how you start off it's how you end <laughs> and then he says then it's for us to be upon fear, upon hope, but be upon extremely fear that Allah Jalla wa Ala do not accept from us our righteous actions. So he says that Allah Jalla wa Ala, he says in his Quran, and a tremendous ayat that highlight this point, is that only Allah Jalla wa Ala, fi surah al ma'idah, innama yataqabbal Allahu min al-muttaqeen, that Allah only accept the actions from those who have taqwa. And this was pertaining to the two sons of Adam. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, innama yataqabbal Allahu min al-muttaqeen, that Allah only accept the actions from those who have taqwa. So he says that So think deeply, ponder, reflect within your own selves and also reflect in regards to your intentions why are you doing such an act? Why are you doing this or why are you doing that? And regards such as your aspirations, your goals, your objectives, what are you setting out to carry to do? He says, and none, none of you, not any one of you from amongst you should be deceived or be amazed, rather. To be amazed, meaning that none of you from amongst you should be amazed with what any actions that you were able to carry out. Don't be amazed by your actions. Um, rather, an individual should consider himself in regards to his deficiencies. And he should consider himself in regards to his negligence. Would he have fell short in? Would he neglected to carry out?
وينكسر بين يدي ربه عز وجل كان بعض السلف يقول لو أعلم أن الله تقبل مني مثقال حبة من خردل لتمنيت الموت So the shaykh begins to cry here because he mentions that uh, Allah Jalla wa Ala, the individual is going to be brought in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, rather it comes from some of the reports of the Salaf that they used to say, Law a'lamu have I known that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taqabbala was to accept from me just a atom's weight, a atom's weight of deeds, just accept from my deeds, just an atom's weight worth, very minute. If I known that Allah would accept any of that from my deeds, I will hope from Allah death. I hope you understand the implications here. The Shaykh, you know, alhamdulillah, he begins to become uh, very emotional and he begins to cry at this point because all of us wish that we had an action that is mutakabbila, that is accepted. So if you just know just an inkling that Allah Jalla wa Ala will accept your deed, when you want to die in that state because you know that that deed is actually accepted by Allah. So he says, ending this beautiful clip, he says that this was only due to their extreme fear that they had of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they were reflective upon that. And I wanted to begin this talk off, bi'ithnillah, uh, with translating these words because since it's about my journey becoming a translator. And also as a reminder to myself, my intentions for doing this, my goal, my objectives for carrying this out and to be sincerely done for the sake of Allah, and not to be seen or not to be one to be a person who's one to be known for this, but as a way of encouragement and realizing that no matter what actions we put forth from whatever we ever accomplish in life, it's all by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's up to Allah whether or not he's going to accept it. So without that, I want to start off. Um, interestingly enough, it was the year 2009. I believe I just came back from Egypt by this time. Um, and I came across um, some falus. And a brother of mine who lived around the corner from me at this time just um, made Hajj, I, I, no, he made Umrah with his wife. And he was, you know, advising me and saying, brother, instead of you going back to Egypt, you should go visit Allah's house. And I started to ponder and think about that. And I said, you know what, you're right. Um, so, you know, we exchanged um, information. He gave me his traveling agency number and stuff like that. And I was able to be set up to go to um, Mecca and Medina, alhamdulillah. But before I left, he asked me to uh, make a specific du'a for him when I get there. He says, brother, make a du'a that Allah Jalla wa Ala make me of those who can translate um, the works of the ulama. So when I got there, I made the du'a. Alhamdulillah, you know, I did everything I supposed to do. I remember the brother and I made the du'a for him. So when I came back, I think like, I think three weeks or four weeks um, after I got back by the permission of Allah Jalla wa Ala to make an Umrah, um, I think, I don't know, the notion hit me there. I got with another brother, Warith, and another brother in the masjid. And at this time, we were looking at the book. Well, actually, the brother, Abu Noor, he was looking at this book that uh, Sheikh um, Utebi, Sheikh Badr Utebi, Afidullah, have done, which is known as um, Ishroon al Nasiha, 20 Pieces of Advice to My Sister Before She Get Married. And as we were reading the book in the masjid, it was in our Arabic at this time, we decided to sit down and say, you know what, let's go have a crack at it. Each of us do our share, me, Abdullah, and Abu Nur. So we would get together for two weeks straight and we would all just translate portions. You take a chapter, you take a chapter. And we were able to complete it by the permission of Allah Jalla wa Ala. And this was the first book that I ever translate or begin to translate and have pieces of it. Alhamdulillah, I got compensated from um, um, Riot Market 
and uh, the brother Abdullah as well. And the book came out to be a success. We also, I would North contacted the Sheikh, told the Sheikh that we were doing the book, asked him permission that we can translate the book, and the Sheikh gave him his permission, etc., etc., etc. So this started my journey to translating, okay? And at this time, my Arabic, I didn't think was so, you know, I wasn't as I, I, I feel I am now. I wasn't so confident that much as back then as I'm now. So what I would do is, I met another brother, alhamdulillah, brother Saleh, and he was introducing me to uh, some very interesting things as far as business and how to make your own book, how to produce, and such and such and such. Um, so me and Abu Nur, we got together one time. We was like, you know what? Let's start a publication company. We already translate. Let's do such, etc. So we came up with a name called Daru Isned. And we, at this time, was a lot of other uh, authentic statements was out there. You had the brother Rahimahullah who passed away in New York. Um, he was putting out a lot of books. I was able to have a chance to speak with him. Um, and at this time, was a lot of people that were already translating. You have Abu Hassan Malik. You have a lot of the uh, other brothers who were translating this time. So I was telling Abu Nur, since you already have um, a personal acquaintance with Sheikh Mahmoud, who has a um, publishing company there in Egypt, we can somehow connect with him uh, on the English side of things as well as he's on the Arabic side of things, so we probably can like you know corner the market there. Um, needless to say, me and Abu Nur, we are still uh, friends. However, we did not go into the same business direction and introduce hence our brother Saleh which I did my first solo project, um, which was known as Tafsir of the Fourth Kool. Uh, Brother Sali did all of the artwork, also helped print it, the book, and the book um, really was a good book, inshallah. And it was the Tafsir of Surah, uh, Surah Al-Kafirun, Sheikh Iman Sa'adi, and his student, Sheikh uh, Muhammad, um, Muhammad Rastamin. It was a real small quotidian, a small book, and we translated uh, the book, alhamdulillah, and then we did our next work, our project, which was known as A Glimpse at the Two Angels of the Grave. And this was a compilation. It really wasn't too much translating on my behalf. I only translated the speech of uh, Sheikh Abdul Razak. Um, he had some speech which he had in regards to Munkar Nakir that was in his explanation to al Ha'iya. So I translated that and then the rest of it, I just compiled it from a lot of the works of uh, Ibn Kathir. Um, and it became out to be a good book. Um, Sali did all of the uh, artwork for it and everything like that. So this way we are, we are actually, I'm having two books in, and this is before I get into the actual world. Um, I'm going to the Islamic place and things like that, and I'm trying to promote the book. And mankind is funny, so you're gonna meet a lot of different oppositions. You're gonna meet a lot of people that, at this time, once you enter certain and you become a part of a person profession, as Ibn Okanya mentioned, um, when people share the same profession or anything like that, it can be a breeding room or a breeding ground for what they call hasid. And I'm not saying anyone was jealous of me or anything like that, but it was just the fact that I met a lot of opposition from a lot of people because once I got you know, into this arena of translating, it was like, who are you? You're not a student, you're not this. So I'm saying all this to encourage you that Allah Jalla wa ala, he gives to whom he wills. You know what I mean? There is no stipulation that you have to be from the Tulab or Ilm to translate, which is a big misconception as I learned in my journey. But a lot of people think that you have to be, um, you know, a student of knowledge. You have to be someone that is recommended by the scholars. You have to be et cetera, et cetera. And when you find the speech of the ulama, I'm not talking about those who personally, like Sheikh Obeid, who personally made a statement in regards to his um, works. But other than those scholars, you will find like the likes of the huge mountains like Sheikh Rutaymin, Rahmatullah Ta'ala Alayhim, and um, the likes of Sheikh Rabbani, the likes of them that you can translate their works. It wasn't really too many stipulations on translating their works before it became so big of a deal. Um, anyway, as I'm going, me, Abu Nur, and Abdullah get back together again on a, another project which was known as the explanation of the man who killed the 99 men. So what we did is compile different explanations from different of the early map. We went from Shah Muslim, from um, Iman Nawi. Uh, we translated some of his speech. We translated some of Shukh Taymin, Shukh Bin Baz. And we put together another small kutayib at this time. And uh, we were able to publish this particular book. All right. So as we, you know, journeying, we, we, we come across a conference where there were some words that were spread or exchanged with some of the students with our brother Abu Nur in regards to translating the book 20 Pieces of Advice. 
So now I'm getting a little bit, I'm gaining some more confidence. I'm translating these books. I'm, you know, it's the word on the street now. The brother, alhamdulillah, is doing this. And me and the brother at this time, we were able to go to the different places, get I and get ISBN numbers. We learned about that. We learned about getting our barcode. We learned about, you know, connecting with people. I was able to connect with authentic statements at Bull Mesa. And we did several projects together collectively. Um, we did the best of um, the best of mankind. We did the 40 hadith from La ilaha illallah. And we was doing most of these things. This is before I became an imam, so to speak. This is when it was just translating. And interestingly enough, the thing that I get most out of this story is that, for myself, is that Allah Jalla wa'ala really is in control. I remember there were nights that I would pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant me understanding of Arabic. I didn't set most of the classes that brothers was having Arabic, when Hassan Somali was having his Arabic class, when Abu Hassan Malik was having his Arabic class, when the brothers were having the Arabic class down in um, Ahl Hadith, when brothers were having multiple Arabic classes, I would try to get with different people and you know, go over those Arabic class, such as it was Ezra it was Cetra, et etc. I even got with the brother um, uh, Abdullah. Actually, I got on some one on one with the brother Abdullah. And that's his case, is another case that is very um, amazing. It's just show you that we cannot restrict Allah's bounty. You understand? We don't have to think that a person has to travel abroad just to get a piece of information. Muhammad ibn Munir, another inspiration. Um, himself, um, before he skipped the actual, um, the Mahad of Ar Arabic when he got to um, Medina. He didn't even have to do the Mahad because he learned Arabic when he was here. So it's an encouragement that you don't have to believe, you know, the quote unquote narrative that you have to be somebody in order to, you know, learn and, 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 and learn. You can take your time now and begin to study, but always make the dua, always be sincere, and Allah Jalla wa Allah will help you. So we started translating these books. We started pitting them out, and, and, and interestingly enough, it was it, it was moving. And I had heard comments. It was brothers that I knew that was actually, you know, said statements about me. Look at the way that the brother trusts. I can tell you the brother don't know how to translate. The brother, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who give him authority, and so it led me into being an imam because I was approached by an individual on that term, and that that'd be another discussion all along. But as we get, as we work and we're putting all of these books out, so we started putting CDs out and then we started putting different things. And my Arabic was actually progressing and I was contacting a lot of the different brothers I know, like the brother Nur, um, my man Abu Earth uh from Ghana up there at Wasatiya. I met him in Egypt. He used to help me out a lot. He did some projects with us, multiple projects, but he also used to help me out with my translation. So what I would do is whenever I come across a problem. I remember learning from Abu Hassan Malik a term that he was using when we was in his Arabic class. He was talking about the concept of what we call siyakul jumla. All right. So in Arabic, just like in English, sometimes what is called context clues. So what happened is you might read a whole paragraph, and if you understand eighty percent. 90% of the actual paragraph, but there are some words in there that you may not understand. But due to the context, the context, the context of the actual paragraph, you can get a gist to what that actual word may mean without even looking that word up. And I was good at this. And I give you an example. The, the clip I just translated from Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Saleh Fuzan, before I started this video, before taking my son to school, I shorthanded. I shorthanded the clip, right? Instead of going off the fly, I written it down. And it was a word in there that I'm pretty sure that uh, I didn't really understand so much. I'm pretty sure I really didn't understand it. But through everything and the gist of everything, I was able to use what we call context clues. And I'm good at reading like, uh, alhamdulillah, in English like that. And many of you are like that. You read a, a paragraph, you might not even know what that word means, but just because you know what they're talking about and what the theme of the story is, or, you know what I'm saying, the paragraph, you're able to put together that like, that word must indicate this or lose that, and that's called siyakul jumla. So in Arabic, you might not learn everything. Like, you're not gonna know all of the words. So at this time, you might not be really strong, but you have to make sure that you consult with those who are more knowledgeable than you. So what I would do is I would always have a number that I can contact, whether it's Abu Nur, whether it's Nur, whether it's different brothers I can call. 
I will contact him, Naeem Abu Abdullah, Abdullah. I will contact him and I will ask him, okay, I read this, this is what I get from it. Can you help me understand what do you get from it? And they would say, no, the, uh, according to that level of Arabic, no, the knowledge is this, 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 that. Then if I go back and look it up, then I'm able to put it together like that. And I was able to translate, I mean, with no formal teaching by the permission of Allah. All of this shows me that I need to thank Allah even more. And that's why that clip that we translated in the beginning is very important. None of us should become amazed with anything that we do. We have to thank Allah Jalla wa Allah, and be sincere in our intentions because it's up to him whether or not he's going to accept it from us. And we have to understand that. So I hope that my journey to trans becoming a translator will inspire you. I don't have any formal training. I don't have formal teachers. You can do it. If you really set yourself aside, you really make the dua, you really become sincere, you can become strong, you can translate, you can do whatever you set up to do. Long as it's permissible, long as it's pleasing to Allah as a wajal, Allah will aid you in that endeavor. You do not have to believe a narrative that you have to travel nine hours, eight hours, all the way overseas just to spread the word of your Lord, just to understand what your Lord is saying, just to understand what the Prophet was telling saying. And we're not negating the fact of traveling abroad is a part of seeking ilm. No one is saying that. That is, that we're not negating that. That is actually a part of tahsil ilm. A part of seeking knowledge is traveling, especially traveling to the scholars. And we know that the ulama of the past, they've done this. So we're not going to say that that's nothing bad. But we're just saying that you can exhaust all of the information you got right in front of you. We got so many different programs, so many different books, so many different things at our fingertips. If we were just to sit down and take our time to learn them, we would have a lot of information. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You will find a person who is an army, a person who is a commoner, you will find them more well-versed in certain areas and certain issues of the deen than a talib or ilm. You see, you have to understand that talib or ilm have different stages. So somebody might learn in a methodology way, I mean, in a systematic way, and they might learn a certain subject or a certain science, and that's what all they was focusing on, on that subject, on that science, and on that approach that they were learning. But then there were other areas of the deen that they wasn't strong on, that wasn't their strong points, they wasn't well versed in those areas. This is why you find a statement from Imam Nawawi that he says that the beginning student, well not the beginning student, he said that the student of knowledge should begin with memorizing the book of Allah first and foremost. All right, And this is a format that you see from all of the biographies of the early man. Um, starting with the book of Allah. And then he would say that the student should take a small muqtasra, a metan, a small metan, a small text, treatise, that's like an introduction to each science in Islam and memorize it, comprehend it, and understand it. That way he will be grounded in all of the science of Islam just at an introductory level. And even Sa'idi used to teach this to his, his students as well. Why is I'm bringing this up at this time is because I'm trying to explain to you is that all you have to do is really believe in Allah as a wajal, really set out to accomplish your goals, do not worry about what people say, the naysayers or anything, and exhaust those informations and you can achieve something. You can achieve something. So I'm able to sit in front of you guys and translate the works of the scholars. Um, by the permission of Allah, I remember one time we was having a telelink. And it was called Masjid Tawbah at this time. It's back to call it Masjid Tawbah again. But before, when I came down as the imam, I uh, believe the brothers, uh, Muhammad Benir, had tagged this in on a telelink with one of the scholars in, um, in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca. His name was Abdul Al-Majid. Um, Abdul Majid. Uh, and this particular scholar, he was, you know, telling us the beauty about uh, connecting the heart and things like that. He was giving a beautiful lecture. But I wanted to ask the Sheikh some questions. And I was able to put forth the, the question. I asked the question. And, and the Sheikh was actually surprised in the way that I asked my question and the way that I addressed him. And the fact that, okay, here's a guy in America who really don't have too much formal training. The Sheikh don't know nothing about that too much. But he actually mentioned that he was surprised literally in the actual the talk because he actually said I like that guy alhamdulillah and um, I was able to get some questions about what do you say about a person who doesn't have formal training who doesn't who isn't a student of knowledge who didn't graduate from any college but he found himself in a position of being an imam he finds himself in a position of giving khutbah khutub 
Um, he finds himself in a position teaching classes. What do you say? He says, I'm not going to give a personal fatwa. He said, I'm not going to give a personal fatwa, but my personal opinion. He was saying that it's a person like that should stick to the aqwal, the statements of the ulama, read from their works, translate their works, and suffice or suffice himself with that. That way you will be using what the early man is saying. And that's what I was trying to do. Well, that's what I've done, inshallah, mostly throughout my time of being an imam. And like I said, my journey to being a translator, man, was amazing. I'm still amazed to this day. Even when I was writing down this, um, without any formal trainer, to be able to write down and hear precisely what the Sheikh is saying and translate what the Sheikh is saying. You can get to this level. You can get past, surpass this level. You have to tell yourself and push yourself and motivate yourself. No matter how old you are, no matter whatever, you can reach this level. You don't have to wait for someone else to come along to tell you what your Lord is saying or to tell you what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying or to tell you what the scholar is saying because that leverage that we give to people sometimes is a big mistake because what we do is we place the understanding of our deen in the hands of a translator and that translator whether or not you know it is 90% of the time giving you what he understands from what the sheikh actually said and you're not able to go back to the sheikh and ask the sheikh this this or that you're getting the understanding of that translator and also another thing you have to understand with the translator is that the translator will sometimes leave off things that the scholar was actually saying that might be key points and they might hold it back because they might deem in their own discretion that the people aren't ready for that and you don't want to be at that point or at the mercy of someone's understanding of the deen, you understand? You want to be able to understand on your own. So I encourage you all to learn the Arabic language. It's not difficult. The only difficulty with learning the Arabic language comes in the beginning. That's when we're talking about grammar, nahu. All right? When we're talking about grammar, the beginning part, as Sheikh Rathimi mentioned, is like a bab, what we call a bab of hadith. It's like an iron door. But once you enter that dakhalt, once you enter that iron door, kulli shayin ba'da dhalik, everything after that will become halawa, sweet. Everything after that will become halawa, become sweet. And it makes sense for you and it becomes easy for you. And you can learn it right here in America. You didn't even have to travel abroad. You can learn the Arabic language if you take your time, just like you learn about engineering, just like you learn about um, becoming a nurse, just like you learn about all of these different things because they are career-based oriented things and you think that they're going to um, you know, land you a good job or land you some good money or set you up where as though you can you know, be better off, you and your family, then think of the Arabic the same way. The Arabic can land you something better than all of that. What the Arabic can land you is a direct link and understanding to your Lord. The Arabic can actually give you that direct link to understand it to your Lord, meaning that the Quran is the roadmap to paradise, this which is better and everlasting. So at that time, you need to learn. The prayer is said in, in Arabic. Um, the du'as are said in Arabic. Even though there are permissible du'as to say outside of Arabic, but the best du'as are those are already recorded from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam authentically attributed to him. So we want to advise the people, Please go back and learn your Arabic. I don't care how old are you are, how old you are. I don't care how burnt out you think you are because you used to be in the days of, in the days of the times before you were a Muslim, or you were sinning in those days, uh, you know, and you were getting high or whatever the case may be. Don't believe the the rumors that now I can't get it. Eat raisins. Do certain things. Allah Jalla wa Ala can purify people. You're talking about companions who were drinking, who were doing everything X, Y, and Z under the sun. When Islam came, they were like 40 years old, 45 years old, 50 years old, and they memorized the whole entire book of Allah. The whole entire book of Allah. 55 years old, on a battlefield fighting, fasting, doing all these different things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided them and gave them that strength. That's where your strength comes from. And if you gain anything from this talk, inshallah, hopefully... Like I said, I want to inspire you all to learn the Arabic language. Just quick tips real quick. When you begin to study the Arabic language, there should be two things in your mind. Um, that's very important. And it helps you focus your sincerity. One is that you learning the Arabic language is to understand the book of Allah and the Sunnah. Not so that you can pop fly. Not that you, so you can have the girl turn her hair to, towards you. Not so you can speak in this group or that group. Not so that you can even speak. Learning the Arabic language is not so that you can just speak, all right? But we're going to get to the second part. That part is the main part. 
you can actually learn Arabic so that you can conversate and understand what your Lord is saying. And when I say conversate, meaning recite, meaning dua, and also listening to the hadith, or the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and also listen to the ayat. Tayyip. The second thing is iqamatul lisan. Iqamatul lisan. The second thing you want to make sure, a part of your intentions of learning Arabic, is to straighten your tongue out from any errors. And this you have to take in consideration, especially if you're going to be in an Arab country or in an Arab society. And when I say Arab, I'm not just talking about the Arab, the people of Arab of Arabia Peninsula. I'm talking about anyone that can speak Arabic. If you're going to be in a society where the language is heavily spoken, or the language is heavily used and people are fluent, then in this case, you want to make sure when you speak, you're speaking without any grammatical errors, without any um, um, ambiguity or confusion. So you want to make sure you're pronouncing the words correctly. You want to make sure you're doing this and that. And this is something here, most people start to tend, and that's what we do. We put what should become last first. Most people want to learn Arabic for speaking, and then you find out those people never begin to speak in the first place, and they never take it serious. Have they approached it in the way that they should have approached it? Inna anzalna, inna anzalna alayk al Qur'ana Arabiyan la alakum ta'akilun. As Allah Jalla said, indeed, we have sent down the Quran as an Arabic Quran. We have sent down to you, revealed to you, in a Quran in Arabic, Quran in Arabic, and la alakum ta'akilun, so that you may understand. So, if you want to really, really, really understand, you have to learn Arabic. So, why would you sit there and miss that major part? Reading the Book of Allah, understanding the Book of Allah. Take your time to learn Arabic. Do not allow yourself to um, imagine. Ah, this is going to be too much. I can't get it. Ah, no, 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 no. You can get it. Allah is going to aid you to get it. And two things go hand in hand with the book, with, with, with um, learning Arabic. And that is Quran. So as you're learning Arabic, Sheikh Mukbil and a lot of the other scholars, even in the past, they used to sit at the beginning, students should concentrate on two things. When learning Arabic, you should be learning the book of Allah. Learning the book of Allah is what they call the mother of the tongue, okay? Because it's classical Arabic, it's the Arabic of the highest eloquence. And you can see the speech is very clear. So when you're learning the Arabic, you can learn with the book of Allah. So as you memorize it, you can also learn Arabic. And that's what helped me out a lot, really, to be honest with you. Because my love that I grew and, and the Lord placed in me for the book of Allah, I was able to now, once I was starting learning Arabic, it made sense. I was in Egypt one time, and I remember the Arabic teacher over there, he used to come to debate. And he was trying to teach me and his brother that I was staying with at that time some stuff he was, he was saying in the story. But he said a word that he was trying to explain the word to me. But when he said the actual word, I automatically was able to identify it because I went right back to a verse in the Quran that has the word. So I was able to pour from my memory a verse that I heard Allah Jalla wa Allah say to connect the dots with understanding the word. This is why the Quran is important to learn. So, inshallah ta'ala, hopefully everyone gains something from my <laughs> and night your passion and that you get back to your zeal, become zealots in learning this Arabic language. And inshallah ta'ala, stay tuned. I do have some courses that will be coming out soon that will be helping out with the Arabic language. Um, I have a, a nice, two extensive week for those who are at beginners that need to learn Aleph Bata. I'm going to also be teaching that. Also, I have a nice, a nice um, series on just learning the Arabic grammar, the simple um, forms of uh, the Arabic grammar. You can actually learn that. So I'm gonna have these courses available, inshallah ta'ala. I will keep, keep you all posted with all of the details, how you can sign up, how you can get a part of it. And let's get back to learning this Arabic language, inshallah. Yes, I do not have ear degree, but guess what? Degrees come from who? People. But what comes from Allah? Sincerity. Meaning Allah has the one to accept. He raised people whom he wants. So do not let that you know, deter you and say, well, the brother don't have this, the brother don't have that. Just notice that Allah, Jalla wa Allah, place people and give people what he wants to give them if they're sincere. Whatever we said that was incorrect for myself and the shaitan, whatever we said was correct from Allah, Jalla wa Allah, subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Jazakallah khair.